Hi, and welcome to the third part of my series on a guide in completing CXC Mathematics SBA. In this section, we will be looking at the method of data collection. The method of data collection is the section that helps the reader to determine if your research method would produce results that are accurate, valid, consistent, and reliable. Accuracy has to do with how close a measured value is to the real value. For example, if you were to find the sample mean, then the sample mean should reflect about the same value as the population mean. Consistency deals with when the results are the same no matter what point in time you conduct the research, providing that all the variables remain the same. Reliability, on the other hand, deals with consistent results being obtained by different researchers. That is to say, if a research is conducted by different individuals, once the research is done with the same level of integrity, then the results remain the same. This section has the following components. Variable identification, method description, identification of sampling type and the size, and the data type is also identified. Let us look closely into each and every component in this section. Let us begin with the variable identification. Any feature or characteristics that changes within the study is called the variable. For example, if you are studying the average mathematics score made by fifth form students at a secondary school, then average score will be the variable. In mathematics, as you know, we often use symbols, for example, x bar. X bar here could mean the average score made by fifth form students. It is important for you to note that when identifying the variable or variables in your research, clearly state what the variable or variables is or are, or state the meaning of all symbols used in the research. No algebraic symbol should be introduced unless an explanation of the meaning of the symbols are also given. Let's look at the method description. This section gives details of how the research was conducted. Further details in this section are given on how the sample was chosen from the population. This includes the sample size and the type of sampling. We will discuss this shortly. Further, information on how permission to study the respondents will obtain should also be in this section. This is especially for those students who are under the age of 80. In this section, please include a sample of the letter of permission sought by their parents and place this letter in the appendix. It also contains information on how your research data was obtained. That is, it must also contain the type of data used. This is an important criteria because it gives you the marks sought in this section. Finally, this section should also include what was the approach used to answer the research question. Let us look at the type of sampling. There are five types of sampling, the first of which is called random sampling. Random sampling is when each respondent has an equal chance of being selected. For example, if you wanted to select 100 students from your population, then you would have assigned each student at your school 
to a number and these numbers will be placed in a hat shaken up and 100 names will be selected without replacement this way every student in your school would have had an equal chance of being selected pretty much like the lottery the other type of sampling is called systematic sampling this is where you place all your students in a line and you select the nth respondent in the line for example if your school population was placed in a line and the 20th person was selected starting from the beginning of the line this is a form of systematic sampling the other type of sampling is called convenient sampling this is where you select the first respondent that you have seen maybe walking on the corridor or you may have conveniently seen them at the canteen the other type of sampling is called cluster sampling that is where you put the population into groups for example your school population may have been placed into forms let's say form one form two form three form four form five or you may have even put them in groups according to their ages these groups would be called clusters then the clusters will be randomly selected but after the cluster has been selected each and every individual within the cluster will form your respondent as an example if you were to put all the forms in a hat and randomly select form 3 then every student in form 3 will be your respondents. This is your cluster sample. Then we have the stratified sampling. This means that you put the whole population in groups and select any of the first three types of sampling, either random sampling, systematic sampling, or convenient sampling. Now there are advantages and disadvantages of each and every one of the sampling but I will recommend the first type of sampling and the last type of sampling. The last type of sampling is more potent than the first because of the fact that the results would more likely be a representation of the entire population. Here's a specific example of stratified sampling you can use in your research. Let us say you will find in the average height of your school population. Then, what you could have done was to use clusters from forms 1 to 5. And in each of your group, you randomly select 20 students from form 1, 20 students from form 2, 20 students from form 3, 20 students from form 4, and 20 students from form 5. When we would have used these samples, as our respondents then this would give a better reflection of the entire population let us now look at the sampling size the sample size is primarily dependent on the level of accuracy that is required to give more details of this concept requires mathematics beyond the scope of this course However, one rule of thumb can be given is that you restrict your sample size to 100. That is to say, whatever your population size is, try to restrict your sample size to 100. If the population is less than 100, then use the entire population. Now let us look at the type of data. Data is classified into two main groups, categorical data and numerical data. Categorical data is further subdivided into nominal data and ordinal data. Nominal data is where we give names to the statistical data, for example, male, female, etc. Ordinal data is where we order the data that is first, 
second, fifth, etc. For the purpose of this exercise, we will be focusing on numerical data. Numerical data can be classified into discrete data and continuous data. Now let us look at discrete data. Discrete data are data that can take certain values. In other words, they are countable. Here are some examples of discrete data. The number of students in a school. The number of items in a math test. Shoe sizes. These are all discrete data because we can all count these values. Shoe sizes seems a little tricky, but you can count the values because we only have a limited amount in terms of the size. We can have five, five and a half, and six. We don't usually have numbers between five and five and a half. Looking at continuous data, continuous data has values that can be measured but not counted. Let me give you an illustration. Suppose if I had this ruler, observe carefully what happens between these two points, the 26 point and the 27 point. There are 10 subdivisions there. We can see that. But could we have more than 10 subdivisions within these two values? Of course we can. We can measure up to 1,000 of a millimeter. This is usually done with this instrument. But can we get more than 1,000 of a millimeter between these intervals? Of course we can. And here is where continuous data comes in. There is no limit to the amount of subdivisions you can get within two units or within two counting numbers. And for this reason, we say the data is continuous. Some examples of continuous data are weight, height, and length. This is because you can have a weight of 5.6874389 kilogram, and you can have a height within those dimensions or even smaller. The same thing applies for length. Temperature is also an example of continuous data. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next video where we'll be discussing the presentation of the data. Please don't forget to like and subscribe.